save it. I'm going to mute you. Robert already is. Let me bring, we're getting some more folks in here. Here comes Carol and Janice is here. Great. Hi, Carol. Hi, Janice. Good to see you. Okay. Hi, Bobby. <laughs> Tracy, you probably recognize yeah, Bobby. Sure, absolutely. Hey. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started, Fred. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. There'll be others coming, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll we'll pop them in. I'll watch for them here. Okay, you do that. That's good. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our last session of our winter series. It's been a delightful last few months. And we're looking forward to our caboose speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Tracy Hodgson is joining us from Chemeketa. Uh, she, let me tell you a little bit about her. She got her uh, bachelor's from University of Kansas and her MA and her PhD from Boston University and has taught um, in a variety of places from BU to Missouri Western State, Penn, Penn Valley Community College, Hiram College, and landed at Chemeketa in 1998. Uh, she's won all kinds of awards for being an outstanding instructor, and I can attest to that. And uh, we're delighted to have her here tonight to talk to us about uh, basic American history, just kind of all over the place as it kind of revolves around and gives us the processes that we've been looking at the last few months around racism, systemic racism, and multicultural insensitivities. Um, so Tracy, we're going to let you get started. And okay. this is very casual tonight, as it always yeah. is. Please feel free to unmute yourself and pop in if you have questions. If you would Absolutely. rather write down your questions and wait until the end, that's okay too. So I'm just going to turn it over to Tracy to take us on a roll here. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, I figured it out. I've been teaching college U.S. history for 28 years and 22 years at Chemeketa. But yeah, I've taught in Ohio and Missouri and Massachusetts and a lot of places. And I want to just talk a bit, reflect a little bit about how history education and civics education, government education has changed over that time and where I think we're at, um, particularly when it's, as it reflects race. And if something pops in your mind, you have a question as you go, let me know. So as teachers, we've always, we've been at that moment when a student says something or answers something where it's really clear that there's some pretty big gaps in their knowledge that you hadn't anticipated. Um, maybe they look at a picture of Abraham Lincoln and they think it's Theodore Roosevelt. Um, if they think the Declaration of Independence is the US Constitution, maybe they can't tell you the name of any African-American that lived before 1960. Um, or maybe they have a general sense that there was racism in the past, but they can't really point to anything other than a, just a general outrage. Um, that happens pretty common and it, it's pretty hard. I think as you get older, it's easier because there's more things that you personally remember. And of course, everyone should know what you know and our students really don't. There's nothing like feeling old, like teaching students that remain the same age year after year after year, and you just get older. But, um, you know, it really hits what I think where we're at at our society. There's never been a more sophisticated understanding of history, and, and there's been a 40-year effort among historians to try to reshape what we call history and what we study in history classes to be more inclusive to not just look at the history of politics or um, economic issues, depending on when you took history, that may have been all you focused on in a history class, to try to have a history of the nation that reflects the realities of as many people as possible. If you're a white man, it's never been hard to reconnect <laughs> on some level with the history that you're taught. 
But if you're a woman or if you're African American or Native American or Asian American, it has often felt very um, alienating and a part of the way in which you're made to feel like you don't belong in this nation, the, the history that you learn. So there's been a 40 year project among historians to stop that and to expand that, um, both who we talk about and what we talk about. Um, the person I replaced at Chemeketa told me when he was retiring that he didn't really talk about women in history classes because they really didn't do anything. <laughs> the last day of the term, he would mention them like for 20 minutes at the end. And I was so shocked, I didn't even know what to say. But that really reflects, you know, what we used to think about history. It was, um, it was congressional acts, it was wars, it was, um, was things that men have been in charge of over time. And so the, the effort of historians has really been to expand, to look at other things and see them as just as important to understand the world, um, to look at religion and, and religious movements and see how important they are. Men aren't the only ones involved. In fact, women are crucial to all those movements. To look at class and how economic class plays a role, to look at gender and how um, men and women experience ex things differently. Um, and to look at race and ethnicity. And I think the fundamental project that's so hard, and I think we're still working on it, is to, is to shift who is speaking in the history class or from whose view we're looking. Um, there's a concept in women's studies called the male gaze, the idea that movies are made as if you're a man looking at the experiences. Um, or magazines are made as if they are a man looking at things. And I think history has that problem too. We have a, a gaze at things that um, men and particularly white men have been really um, significant in. And if we can shift that gaze or we can write history so that different people get a chance to show us their perspective, we're the best. It's really hard. And I think that's why we're really struggling to get there. Um, because the more you include, the, 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 the harder it is to create some sort of um, timeline or um, something that moves forward in a meaningful way for students. But it, it's been really exciting. I think it's been really meaningful for people. And I think we still have a long ways to go. So on the one hand, we're doing that and that's really exciting. On the other hand, it seems as if the more information we get in the world, the less people are taking in. And I think there's been some real shifts in how people are taught history, particularly in high school that I, I want to talk a little bit about that concerns me. It concerns me for our society, but it also concerns me for our students of color, which are becoming more and more a uh, larger part of the population, even here in Oregon um, over time. So what does a good um, history education look like? It's the whole package. It's a, learning a lot of little facts and dates and events and battles and um, congressional acts and um, any, any little nugget of history, knowing a lot of those and learning a lot of those is really important. But that's not enough because history isn't really just memorizing facts and dates if that's not important on its own, but having an analysis on top of it in which you can talk about issues and ideas that affected in the United States over time. And then you pair those two together and what you have is a good history, one that talks about issues, but has the facts that back that up. And that would be true of race as well. So not just talk about how racism plays a role, but be able to pinpoint places in which it has played a role in different ways and how that has evolved over time. And I'm not sure that we're always, always getting that, although that's our goal. Um, one thing that bothers me is my observation of high school education right now is there's essentially two levels of history education that you can have. And um, students of color tend to not get the top tier education. The top tier education tends to be attached to college credit and it's grown over time. Over the last 30 years, it's grown to be larger and larger. This means advanced placement classes, uh, international baccalaureate classes, um, just college classes. Chemeketa offers some in the high schools in the area. And um, students can usually either take a test or enroll and they can get college credit for it. Those classes tend to be very content rich. They're reading textbooks. 
they're writing a lot, they're hearing lectures from instructors, they're taking notes, they're really taking in a lot of the facts and dates and analyzing it in a meaningful way. Um, and then there's the le next level, um, history classes and government classes. And um, they're, they're a variety of quality. This is just my observation seeing students come into the community college. Um, the thinking right now in the education world is that um, lectures are not the best way to learn. And I think that they've overstated that, but there's a uh, very few of the students in regular history classes are getting any prolonged teaching directly from the instructor. Um, textbooks are hard to buy for school districts and um, they're pretty dense to read. They tend to not have textbooks that students read um, because there's no lectures or generally no notes. The real emphasis was interaction in, gr in groups and, and that's meaningful and certainly there's a place for that. Um, but in my opinion, it's a little bit overdone. And the result was you have students that aren't getting the same content rich history. They're, they're learning about issues and they're talking about it, but they don't always have the in-depth study of different um, time periods. And the problem is that we all, we need all of that. And we don't need to have an upper class that only a few people are getting the best quality at history education. Um, it tends to people have money for the IB and the AP, it costs a significant amount of money to take those tests. Um, often there is a barrier. You have to have a special privilege from a teacher to get into those classes. So there's privilege at work and um, it takes more time. So people who have jobs after work tend to not do that. So that means poorer students. So we don't have the same access of students of color to that high quality history. Why does that matter? Because good history can really give you the tools to understand that inclusive history in the past that can be really meaningful to you as an individual. But if you want to work for social change, as hopefully many of us do, you, history really helps you understand the past and how the issues have evolved in the past so you can understand the present. And with that knowledge of the present, then you can work towards the future. Without understanding that past, it's hard to move forward. And it's hard even to identify what you need to do. I guess one example that pops to mind right now in the news is all the laws that are being considered in state legislatures around the nation to um, require more proof for voters to vote. And on the surface, that seems very innocuous. If you don't know history of the United States, what's the big deal? You just wanna make sure that people know how to vote. But if you understand that, that it, those are tried and true mechanisms that have been used over time to target certain populations and to silence their vote, then it really helps you understand that. So. It, a good round history, if everyone could have access, I think we could really um, empower uh, and a sense of inclusion, the sense that American history, we're all Americans and our history is all a part of that. And uh, that also help us all move towards um, understanding the role that race plays and other race issues play in our nation. Today, um, history is not really popular right now. Um, Fewer students are interested in taking it. Standardized testing in the high schools has really challenged how much it's emphasized uh, for probably good reasons. The decision was standardized tests weren't going to test history. It could probably just be a set of facts and dates and maybe would be hard to test. But as a result, it hasn't had the emphasis, particularly in the, a few years ago when the No Child Left Behind um, federal law really put a lot of pressure in. They needed to have students pass or they were gonna lose funding. Um, and that's been a challenge. One thing you may not know is Oregon really doesn't teach a lot of history to students. Um, they learn Oregon history in fourth grade. And fifth grade is the only time regular students learn colonial history and the history of the American Revolution. Um, there's a lot of issues of complex race issues, Native American, white conflict, Slavery gets instituted in the United States at the time. There's a lot of colonization issues and conquest issues. And those are all handled by fifth grade teachers. They have a couple introductory US history classes in their undergraduate degree and that's it. Um, and so that's the only time that time that is talked about. Tracy, and, yeah. Tracy uh, are, you, are you saying uh, in high school that's true also that there's no government and, and 
of American history taught in high school? There is. So in eighth grade, they learn from the revolution to reconstruction, which is right after the Civil War. And then in 11th grade, they learn from reconstruction to the present. But they never go back to that colonial. Yeah, history. yeah, yeah. Unless they're in one of this top tier classes I talked about, the AP classes or the IB classes. And then they definitely do the whole range. And then so how about American government? That tends to be a one semester class in high school. I'd say if there's one place I've definitely noticed the knowledge go down over time, it's government and just basics, how our government works, like how, what are amendments and how do you put amendments into a constitution? I know that stuff is the most interesting to learn, but there have to be ways to really integrate it into real world learning or some way because it hinders people's ability to understand how the government works. And that limits their ability to feel like they're a part of government. We have a real problem with young people not voting and they have a lot of issues that they need the government to handle. Um, student debt issues are intense. College is not affordable. And these issues could be more important if they voted, but they don't seem to be a part, seem to be a part of it. Um, and of course, you know, you have to know the way system works, to try to change the system. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's probably been my biggest shock moments recently about just not understanding um, even um, like how courts, how what courts do are different from what the, the gov Congress does, it's just basic things. And I've looked at the standards, they're in there, they should be learning them. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> What's I think also, you know, there's another thing too, as I was listening to a member of Congress today, and as I was, as, as I was listening to the discussion, I thought, you, you, you've you never had an American government class. Yeah. Member of Congress. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was one the other day that didn't, I forget what it was, but it was something pretty basic. Yeah, so Oregon owning students don't learn a lot of history. Um, and, and some of the most intense in terms of race, that early history, really, the, it's the fifth grade teachers that are teaching it. My experience as a parent, what they're learning is not very different from what was taught in 1945 in the fifth mm -hmm. grade classroom. It tends to be very celebratory, very Patriots focused. And there are ways to take complex history and teach them to five-year-olds, to eight-year-olds, to they would be 11-year-olds, but it's not happening necessarily. And of course they're doing all sorts of other learning. So they're just taking chunks. And I believe that Oregon is teaching less history than any other state I've learned about. So that's a concern. Tracy, and we'll go Tracy. A second. We got a question down here yeah, with yeah. Neil. Uh, I, I take exception to what was taught in 1945 because I was in school in 1945. Yeah. And I remember the, and regarding Fred's question, the, the American civics class was taught and we were taught yeah. the, the history of how the government works. And yeah. that's what you're saying is not happening and I believe it, but uh, I got a, a real good history classes in my education in grade school and high school. I did too. In Oregon. I did too. Yeah, and that and points to another challenge. Our experience of what's being taught generally is what we experienced and maybe what we saw as parents. And there's a wide variety out there. So that makes it challenging for sure. No, I, I, I guess the way that you teach the history of Christopher Columbus um, could be, for example, could be a number of ways. You could celebrate him as an explorer, as someone who was brave and courageous. And I think that's the way that traditionally he's been taught. And that's the way I think very often he still is taught in fifth grade classrooms. Or you could took, look at him as a first of the line of genocidal killers. And maybe you don't want to go there exactly with fifth graders. But I guess I was saying the way that colonial history is taught is not necessarily changed that much over time in fifth grade. Now, I think in these uh, top lower level classes, I, they are in high school and I, I wish everyone had access to them. Was there somebody else had a question? Yeah, uh, Erica, you had a question. Yeah. I have so many, I don't know where to start. So let me yeah. stay with what you're talking about. Um, I was, I grew up in San Francisco um, yeah. during the forties and fifties. Yeah. Never liked history, hated it completely. 
I don't like memorizing, okay? Yeah. I'm almost a four point student, but I took a B in anatomy in college. Uh, I was a bio sci major, among other things. Um, simply because memorization to me is, I can always look it up. Today, yes. it's just so easy, you Google it. Yes. So it strikes me that what we need to do and your frustrations with history, and you're, you're skirting around the edges, but I know you're on this page, is to um, think more heuristically, so to speak. In other words, take themes. Like right yes. now, we were just talking about uh, uh, civics. Yeah. and how people on average don't understand the significance of the political arena today and what's going on in Washington mm -hmm. um, and why it's important in the context of, now you can come back to racism, call yeah. it inclusivity, call it what you want. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. And I thoughts, think you know, your thoughts about that, is history yeah. moving forward or are you handicapped K-12 by school boards that are still thinking 45? 1945, sorry. Well, yeah, that certainly is a place. I mean, I don't know how many of you followed. There was controversy about the new AP mm -hmm. history outline a few years ago. And my favorite sign about that, there was some kid in um, suburban Denver had a sign that said, history is not a fairy tale, which I totally approve. There was controversy. Well, there was misinformation that somehow no one was going to talk about George Washington anymore in U.S. history classes because they looked at the outline and they saw that his name wasn't there. Um, it doesn't mean you don't teach about him. If it says, you know, Revolutionary War, pretty sure you're going to teach about him. Um, but it was about changing the focus and that can be controversial. And we saw this recently in the the controversy over the 1619 project that came out of New York Times that really its main goal is to say African American history is central to US history. That's the mainly the message, but some got concerned and actually it was at the very end of the last administration they had a 1776 project that came out and the, the point is who gets centered in history right the 1619 right. project tried to have a, a a new way. What if we centered history on, on African Americans? What would that look like? That really was what it was. Or 1776 wanted it to be back on white patriots. Mm -hmm. um, but Erica, I think you're right. What, that's what history needs to be. It needs to be talking about issues and ideas. Racism, sexism, um, labor unrest, um, trying to change the world. There's so many themes that really run throughout history. And that's what a good history class focuses on because we do not need to memorize those facts. And we certainly don't in 2021. We have computers with us at every time that can look that stuff up. But what students need is a kind of a good framework that's been placed in a good quality class. They may forget the little details of everything that was in that framework when they learned it. But if they have that sense, that can help them in the world, can help them learn get news and understand, oh, that relates to that thing. Um, or, oh, I see why that's a big deal because I remember learning about World War II and they use that word then too. Um, so yeah, you forget the facts for sure. But if you have a good framework and I think that's what good history classes do, um, my concern is when we have less content rich classes and I think some more of them are that way, you don't have that, it's harder to create that framework. And it's hard no, to I think it's, it's a more inductive uh, or deductive mm -hmm. kind of you approach. Don't have on propositions. Um, yes. and, uh, and then you, you lace mm -hmm. in the factual data that's needed well. to understand that. But there's one more thought I want to share. It's methodology, since I, I was yeah. in higher ed. Oh, nice. And taught large lectures, grad courses, undergrad courses, name it. I was all over the map uh -huh. in my career. And the one thing I learned is students today in particular don't have listening skills. Yeah, that's true. And they presuppose. Mm -hmm. they, in other words, if you have an African-American student and a middle class, upper middle class, upper class white student who in the Midwest is really naive about a lot of you know, what's going on with feminism and racism and all the isms, and they're trying to interact on uh, some theme. Uh, they lay on the expectation that the black person will respond a certain way oh. or that a woman will respond a certain way. 
and you have to wander through that uh, in any class you teach, as you know, depending on the students that come into you. And then you have in a class also forensic feminists and, and uh, African-American black people and so forth, Latinas, Latinx community. And um, they're, they're feeling uncomfortable too, or they're being misread, you know? So I'm gonna shut up now. I could go on for hours. You know, we should have a, you know, a two night uh, marathon of <laughs> coffee sipping and beer sipping or whatever else and we can sort it out. Well, it's true. Students ability to focus is definitely impaired. I think all of our ability to focus, to be honest, I don't just want to put it on young people, has been harder. And it makes it harder to learn that way. And we definitely had to change how we learn. And so I think that's part of where this uh, educational approach in high school, where they're doing a lot more group activities, absolutely understand it. As long as they're also learning a lot of the 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 facts and the information, because that's very empowering too. If you're a Latina and you, you know that there's racism in the world, you can see it every day, but you don't necessarily where it came from getting a good quality history class that um, includes that and allows you to explore that can really be empowering because um, that make you, allow you understand where it came from and maybe empower you, I hope, to try to do something about it in the future. Um, Tracy, thing, yeah, we've got, we've got uh, Rich and Janice. Uh, have a question. I see that. Yes. Yeah, mine is not a question. Of course, I was brought up in the '40s and '50s in the Chicago yeah. area, and uh, of course, I had civics and so forth, American yeah. government, and quite a bit of uh, American history. But I'm bringing up a point that has not been mentioned. Uh, these yeah. kids today. And I think it goes back to their parents to be a little pushy at times. I think the teachers should mention it too. Uh, we've watched just excellent programs on public uh, television on uh, World War I, uh, Coolidge, yeah. uh, the problem of getting uh, people involved in uh, uh, the 20s, but more importantly, Woodrow Wilson, his problems with the Congress and trying to get the people to fight in World yeah, War I. Yeah. And also the uh, Civil War, the problems of uh, the, uh, the Blacks and, uh, during the 1960s, uh, even before mm -hmm. that, the Japanese, how they were yep. placed in the uh, camps uh, during World War II. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of great programs on public television and the History Channel as well. Uh, one of the teachers mentioned that, you know, they're not going to mention it during their classes if they're not even teaching it. But these kids, I know they're not watching these uh, programs, probably teenagers. Why watch it? History Channel? Why watch public television? So <laughs> it's just, it's too bad because it's out there. It is definitely out there. And uh, it's just a shame. I wish I would have had that when I was a kid. <laughs> That's all I want to say. <laughs> No, and their ability to focus for two hours on a documentary is actually uh, getting harder. But um, they don't also, there's so many choices out there. And I think that's one, that's the strength of this nation, the world we live in, and it's also the weakness, right? The strength is you can find all that great stuff. And there are multiple channels that have history content on them when there used to be one, right? Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, there's so much and that it's easy to ignore. And I think that's where our younger people, well, I guess all of us are that way. But particularly, I think one thing that's made a difference is they're not really watching the news or imbibing news on a regular basis. I don't think all of us love the news ever, but there was a time you remember it. If you turn on the TV at 6 p.m., you're going to get the news and that was it. Um, you have more newspapers in your house and maybe they... It, maybe you're getting the newspaper for the comics or for the other reasons or to look for the classifieds, but at least you had it there for someone to look at. And that actually would be my advice if you think about how we can change things is to try to encourage if you have young people around you to encourage them to just get one news app on their phone if they have a phone and just just read the headline as the notification goes by. Even that can kind of keep them in, uh, tuned. Maybe have magazines sitting out so that they can peruse if they need to. Because I think that's really important. And I think particularly our, um, our working class students as they, they enter the professional world, it's gonna be understood that they know that history. And, I, and that's one thing that we are concerned about that they may not have the same, if they're not in a habit of watching news or knowing about history, they could present themselves as being less intelligent and capable than they really are because that's kind of a cultural thing that people in the middle class and above do. 
So encouraging the news, encouraging to watch those shows, talk about history with younger people would be an advice and even share history you were in. Too often we don't share, we think, oh, what I did wasn't that important. And I think that can be the hook as they're getting less um, or maybe getting a little less high quality history in, in schools um, to really imbibe that or just say, hey, I watched this great thing on World War I. Would you watch it with me? Or I, they mentioned this one thing and can I show that to you? And um, Or if you're doing genealogy history, talking about what you found out, I think any personal connection is really, really powerful. Um, so I, when I'm thinking about, instead of just complaining, because it's easy to do that, I think that's one thing that we could really um, be helpful. There is our efforts to try to bring civics classes back. Some of you mentioned you had them. And one person that's behind that is a representative that some of you are represented by, I believe. His name's Paul Evans. He's a communications instructor at Chemeketa. And he's the, in West Salem and Polk County. And he has a bill, House Bill 2299, that would make it a requirement to graduate in Oregon to have a civics class or to pass a civics test. Uh, I don't think it's going anywhere in the state legislature, but um, that could be something that you could rally behind um, to try to get. You know, I think some of these approaches, maybe they weren't approached the right way. Um, and then they got discarded, maybe because they were taught in the way that I think it was Erica mentioned. <laughs> Or maybe they were taught in too dry a manner. People say, oh, we don't need them anymore. And now we're in the other, and coming maybe in the middle. <laughs> Something Tracy, that they, yeah. I, I was in the legislature for 15 years. And one of the things about the legislature is you get into real problems. Uh, and I support what, what uh, he's doing. Mm -hmm. But you get into real problems by, by uh, di dictating uh, curriculum. And uh, sure. one of the one of the best ways to go about uh, getting civics back in in uh, the schools is to go through the school board and the Department of Education. Yeah. Uh, and you know it doesn't take any governor's signature or any problems with Republicans and Democrats. It, that that's the way you can get it done. And I I, I just want to add one other thing: uh, the discussion about and I taught history too uh, about. Uh, uh, dates and memorizing all this stuff and everything. It was Albert Einstein who said, don't memorize anything that you can look up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that that's where we are today. Where we, I, I just finished a book and I did so much just looking up dates that I could find uh, just quickly mm -hmm. on my phone. Um, uh, that, that answers one of my questions, I think. Yeah. And that is, uh, is there... There is no national curriculum then, like the 1619 no. Project. Whatever. There is no national historic. No. So all the curriculum is, is set up by individual school boards. But influenced by uh, greatly by, like Texas is a major textbook uh, uh, yeah, uh, purchaser. It. And so uh, and Texas is often given as, an, given as an example that influences uh, oh, okay. history and social studies. Because they're the purchaser of them. The publishers yeah. say, "What do you want?" Because you're yes. a big market. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I was. I. I heard about Texas, but I was trying to figure that out. I thought this because they were being published there. No, it's that they are a big market. They're a big they market. They cater to Texas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because yeah. yeah, it just seems that. Uh, um, so there is no standardized across. Uh, uh, no. It's all individual school boards. Well, there are state standards, but they tend to be pretty broad. Like you okay. must teach the parts of the U.S. government in fifth grade. How you do it and the materials you do it would be up to the state school board. Oh, okay. Like Robert has a question. We've got Sydney and Carol okay. and Bobby <laughs> and Robert. So let Bobby, let's go to you. Okay, move along. Sydney? I just wanted to say that if you want your eyes opened about something is to listen to the um, state school board for the state of Texas. Mm. It is so racist. It will curl your hair or uncurl it depending on the nature of your hair. Um, it is shocking. And so if you want to influence things, you need to be in touch with where the decisions are happening. And that is one very scary thing, how much influence that racist body has on what we teach and what the that's right. textbook print. That's right. So Absolutely. Writing to the publishers is another thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sydney. Carol? Hi. 
wanted to um, bring up a different point. If a student misses out, maybe they were ill, maybe their mother died that year, maybe like our son was a ex foreign exchange student in 11th grade and missed everything in American history. He was studying European history at the time. Um, my question is, um, maybe the group has some ideas. Maybe they're all in your head, Tracy. What are some of the things that can be done to fill in the holes when, when somebody did not get what was taught at that age level? Take Tracy's class. <laughs> I Absolutely. Will pop, yeah, I will pop in and answer that for you, Carol. It's, <laughs> it's, it often falls to the community college or the college right. uh, basic history courses that the students finally hear it. And it's the horror stories. Tracy could tell you a million <laughs> about how people, students say something in class or write something on their paper and they're, it's like, what? Ignorance, ignorance. I don't know. I don't know, but I think I know. Yeah, I mean, there's so Okay, well, our son is in his mid thirties and working full time. So he's not going to, and he has two master's degrees in okay. other fields. So I don't think I'm going to get him to go to Shemekda. No. But thanks for the idea for other people. There's some pretty good published um, general histories. Right. Um, Jill Lepore put one out recently. I know it's pretty well regarded. It's pretty thick. Mm -hmm. So maybe an audio book as he's driving to it from work or others um, called These. Oh, gosh, I forgot the name. But Jill Lepore is the, oh, uh, the person that wrote it. Um, there's plenty others. I think that's the way to do it. And there's a lot okay. of it. I noticed that in Oregon, um, so one initiative right now in Oregon that is akin to what um, Fred mentioned, there was a law saying that they needed to teach ethnic history in, in Oregon study, in Oregon classes. And what does that mean? It means the history of Latinos, the history of African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans. And the degree to which there was pushback and anger and frustration tells me we have a long ways to go in the quality of history mm -hmm. education. Because I said for 40 years, historians have been working on making a more inclusive history. And if that's controversial today, that means we have history classes that aren't really encompassing that. And I know that from talking to some in the area. So that's something that's going live. And in their list of classes and um, books, there's a series of books, a queer history of the U.S., a, a native, I mean, there's kind of these general, for general public um, consumption history with different um, lenses or filters. And even if you know general history, it's very awesome to, and really revealing to look at it from an issue of gender or maybe look at, at it from African-Americans perspective. You can learn a lot that way. Um, so those are, those kinds Could of- Could you please repeat the name? Um, the could you repeat the name Jill Lepore? Jill uh, Lepore I'll, yeah. I'll put it down in the links that I'll be sending out, Carol. Yeah, if I have time, okay. I'll, you know, I guess I'm talking the whole time. It's these, the, these United States, something like that. But yeah, thank you. Um, she also writes a lot in the New Yorker, I think. Mm -hmm. She's someone that's very public historian. Um, Mm -hmm. and is a really good writer. So I haven't read it, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty good. Uh, there is a problem. Historians have been doing a lot of inclusive work, but they've not really done a very good job at connecting to the general public or even to history classes in K-12 schools. And, and that's something that historians have to work more about. I'm not a scholar, but one thing I do enjoy at a community college is I reach thousands of students every year. I figured it. I think I've taught 15,000 students so far in my career. Yeah. So um, I'm out, and out in the trenches doing my best, but um, I, I'd love to have some help to have more people out there. And um, I think history is so important. I just saw history event referenced every day in the news the last two mm -hmm. years. So it's a shame that less and less history, history is fighting for um, attention, I'd say, in the K through 12, and even in higher ed, our number of majors in history are plummeting, and uh, it's a concern. I think that it's a real basic fundamental knowledge filter by which you see the world, and it's, it's challenging. So it's I guess, it, Tracy, yeah. it's too bad to me that 
that we have to look at those different themes as themes separate from all history. Yeah. You know, ethnic history, well, that's history. That's our history. So all of that should be in, encompassed and, and included in what we learn. Yes, and it isn't, I think, I and that's, that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, they'll say, well, you don't understand. I don't have a lot of time to teach. And of course, that's always a challenge for every teacher. But if it, 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 it signals to students what's important. Right. And that's the challenge. If you have a Latina student in your class and you're not talking about the history of Latinos or Latinas at all, the message is that nothing that my, my ancestors did is important. Right. And um, that's a problem. It, it definitely is a challenge. I'd say another movement that has the same effect is that there's been a move to go to world history classes in, in both high school and college rather than Western Civ. You may have seen Western Civ classes growing up. On the one hand, that's good. It's more inclusive. On the other hand, there's no way you can teach the whole history of the world. There's just no way. And so you make choices. And unfortunately, I think the choices people make send the same message. You're never talking about Australia. Maybe you're never talking about Africa. And so the message you get is in the world, Africa really isn't that important. In the end, it almost ends up being about the same thing as Western Civ, which is, you know, was designed to exclude. Um, or um, like Fred was sharing before, you know, students were like, I don't really understand China, can we move on? And so it, it doesn't always have this inclusive experience that you imagine it would. Tracy, let's take another question from Robert before we move on. Robert? Um, you mentioned books on tape. I listened to LibriVox, and that's how I learned about the Lewis and Clark expedition, how it went at, on a more in-depth level. Yeah. Now, I, I learned about uh, the African experience from Roots. Um, I think if somebody... On Netflix, there's a black channel. Mm -hmm. And um, if maybe somebody could get together with Netflix, they could um, do um, the Pony Express I learned from Bonanza. If somebody <laughs> could collaborate a bunch of things that were popular and easy to list, watch that could... Um, give us, and not yeah. by just the white gaze. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. Bonanza probably has the white gaze, so. Yeah. No, um, I think that's true. And documentaries are actually pretty popular right now on the Netflix. They are, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just came across something new that I think has potential. On Amazon, you can buy experiences, mm -hmm. and it's like for $50, it looks like in real time, somebody will walk me through mm -hmm. a Vienna museum and give me a little tour. I think that has potential. That's a great hand. Yeah. Could they go to some history museum in Virginia that I can't visit and um, maybe walk us through? I, I just had my students go to a virtual field trip in a New York museum. I'd love to do more of that. And um, they were billing a virtual spring break. And I thought, well, that's interesting. A way, yeah. uh, fun educational way that isn't so much a documentary, but you can kind of well, something that the Indians did, I understand, was they had a story that they would tell, and it wasn't a written language, so it was a story that they told, and it made it interesting and connected with them. Yeah. So I think that if you create a nice story, you'll connect with people better than just... Um, I think that that would be a better way to go than to keep their interest. Because in high school, I read a history book, front to cover, I mean, front to the back. I couldn't tell you what one thing was after I'd read one page. <laughs> it, it was so boring. I think my mind wandered all the time. It needs to be well-written, yeah. And storytelling is good. You know, in, in terms of race, people in general, and students also come to it thinking, 
Well, for example, slavery, that it's something that mean people did. They just decided one day to be mean to other people, so they did that. And what they don't understand is the systemic nature of it, the way that the whole society and the whole system was set up to privilege one group over another, to create opportunities for some and limitations for others. And I think that's the framing we need as we learn about US history to really helpfully understand where we're at as a society that, um, and Oregon, we're seeing more of this in Oregon history. You may, you may have heard that they're, you know, in our constitution in, in the 1850s, it said no black people welcome. And they also said that Chinese people could be here, but they couldn't own property. And, um, you know, they're creating limitations for some while extending to others. And I think that systemic nature of it is something that's, it is hard to teach and hard to capture, but it would be so helpful because it's, it's not just about a person being a nice person or a bad person. It's them being in a system that is designed to privilege one group and not another. I put in the chat, by the way, an interesting racial timeline that uh, some educators created for Oregon of the kind of history nuggets that if you're really attuned to an inclusive history, you might teach. These are the kinds of things that really didn't show up in US history classes before 1970, but are now making their way um, in. And it makes it challenging to try to teach, but I think much more meaningful for everyone. Oh, Ken Burns. Yes, mm -hmm. Ken Burns is the master. Bobby, you had a quick question. Well, not quick. Are we That's okay? Are we done? That's fine. Oh, it's not. It's actually not a question. It's it's a little bit of uh, my history in in history class um, in high school, and and I think one of the things that we we uh, don't really focus on is the excitement of the teacher. In that you can be in a class and have the same textbook and someone will walk away because they were taught by someone who loved history mm -hmm. and saw how history connected right to them at that moment. And it gave, gave everyone in the class like goosebumps, you know, because they could, you know, all of that. And then my history teacher was the... Um, was one of the coaches, a football coach, this that would have politics. come in and, and teach history. And first of all, it was a history that was all war oriented. Yeah. So you come away thinking, well, war's the only thing that moves people. War's the only thing that is important in history. War is what keeps, you know, and, and you get this, so uh, anyway, I wanted to make those those two. Um, and then I wanted to say something that, that has to do with my grandson. And um, we were talking and he says something that I think about a lot. He's taking um, history class, middle school, mm -hmm. learning about the Holocaust. Oh, good. Great. This is what he says. He said... In middle school, they teach you sex ed, and then they teach you about the Holocaust. They want to break you. <laughs> and he was, he in his sweet little heart meant that. It, whatever happened in that classroom, and I don't know, and we were at a point where we were interrupted with something else. And I never got more about that, but he was really sincere in, in that the way it was taught, I guess, maybe to be dramatic, all the deaths and the shoes and the, you know, all the, all the images that it was like they, the teachers, the school was trying to break him. <laughs> and, and so my, my grandmother's heart <laughs> kind of cracks for that. <laughs> um, and I just don't, it, it's, it's so complex, you know, who teaches, what they teach, how they teach. And 
that's all. I mean, I, I saved up, but that's all to say. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bobby. Thank you. There is a state law that says the history of the Holocaust should be taught in Oregon. So you're going to hear more of these stories and tribal history and ethnic history. And I think it's just going live. The enthusiasm and the knowledge of the teacher is absolutely paramount. That's what we're not robots and we can't all do it the same. Bobby and I could teach the same class and have to do it differently because we're different people. But that enthusiasm is important. And that's where getting good training for teaching is important. That's right. The other concern I have is, you know, it used to be that history teachers generally had an un undergraduate degree in history or political science in high school. Um, but, you know, college is expensive. And one thing that's happened over time is they've created uh, watered down degrees that instead of five years, you can get through in four. And one is a social studies teaching degree you can get at Western Oregon in four years. You're only taking two history classes on top of the intro classes and then you're teaching history. Mm -hmm. And that's just hard. It's hard to teach something you don't know well and don't know deeply. You need to know it about three times deeper than the students to really teach it well. Another thing I should mention that is important in terms of race and in terms of inclusive history is we have a problem. We have, our, our teachers are not as, as, as diverse in Oregon as our students. Right. And if we could develop more scholarship programs or support networks to get more of our students of color to become teachers of color, I think naturally the kinds of emphases in all classes and including history classes will naturally change probably for the better in a way that can connect with more of their students who are, we know more diverse than ever. Um, and it can be really powerful to study show for us you know, if there's a teacher they have that is an African American like them or a Pacific Islander like them. So that's something we need to work on too, is not only diversity of content, but diversity of teachers. And there'll be a richness of enthusiasm and emphasis and the ideas they bring to the classroom are gonna be different and, and pretty awesome. You know, Tracy, real quick on that subject. Yes, it helps the curriculum, it helps the uh, person of color, the woman, whomever, uh, relate better, but more importantly, diversifying your faculty so that faculty interactions start to open up and dispel the classism. And by the way, I, I really think the primary bottom line culprit here is social class. Mm -hmm. Which class? Uh, social class. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. ethnic viability creates mobility. Mm -hmm. opportunity. You know, you just mentioned the cost of education. Here in Milwaukee, uh, the majority of the Black students in the city of Milwaukee live in poverty, mm -hmm. and COVID didn't help. And this is going on all over the country. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard. I'm with the Women's Fund also. We're a not-for-profit. And we face these challenges in behalf of uh, women's equity, particularly difficult for people of color and the other groups. Um, so I'm gonna have to sign out shortly. I just wanna say, I appreciate uh, being able to join in here and um, thank you all for being patient. I hope patient. you come back April 8th. April 8th is when we'll resume. Oh, I, I think Lori's gonna jump all over my case. <laughs> I doubt it. Well, I have known her since 19. Do I dare share this? Mm -hmm. She was thrilled that you were coming, uh, Erica. Hey, listen, Fred. 19, uh, let me think back, 64. That's right. 1964. Well, well 1964. Thank you. She was a student of mine my first year of teaching. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And by the way, Tracy, yeah. your point about teacher education is absolutely tantamount. Mm -hmm. We've dumbed down these degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, students today do not elect history, mm -hmm. do not take history if they aren't a major, unless gen ed requirements, general education requirements force them. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, what they're thinking when they come in as freshmen, I want to get out of here and into a job and be viable. Mm -hmm. So if they're headed, I was in the College of Health Sciences, so if they're headed into uh, uh, fitness leadership or whatever they're doing, a pre-PT program, their goal is to get the heck out of school 
don't bother me with history. That doesn't relate to the movement. And that's one thing where these AP programs, I think, have made it worse. I know those science types, they want to get their history out of the way in high school. Correct. Correct. So they never take it in college. You know, the whole thing of a liberally educated individual when we were younger in school. Uh, I'm looking at all of us in the 70 plus category here, maybe even 80 plus. Um, I, I, you know, I fought it. But I, I was well educated, and it, it has helped me my entire career, my entire life. And I also support fully PBS. You know, COVID, we're homebound. The whole PBS series, Ken Burns' series, it was mentioned by somebody in the chat room. Um, the history of music in the, in the African American church, the Black Church of America. Oh, that, that was a great series. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Families are sitting down, believe it or not, in my awareness, in my family's mm -hmm. circle here, extended, and they spend time watching those and talking to their kids because they're struggling with homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And if we can get kids to communicate in ways other than social media, they sit next to each other on a couch and text yeah. each other. <laughs> if you can believe that. I'm like, mm -hmm. give me a break. <clears throat> anyway, I am going to, after knowing Lori for over 50 or 60 or 70 years now, whatever it is, I'm going to bug out and uh, I hope you all, I'll come back, Fred. Relax. Good. Good. All I'll right. Sure, sure we want you. Hey, Erica, you know, is she gone? No, she's no. not here. Oh, uh, thank you for your service. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have fun with life. I have not ever backed off of that. And I, sometime we'll have to have a more social session and I'll give you all the dirt on Lori Murphy. All right. <laughs> okay. Hey, but Lori's I, one of the hey, editors you, of my book. I need to know this. Me, you, <laughs> never mind. You have more hair than I do. <laughs> Later. Thank you. Take care, all. Okay, so we've got Ithar with us. Ithar, hi. Good to see hi. you. Cool. Tracy, this is Ithar from Kansas. Hi. Hi. I grew up in Kansas. Everyone That's in my family went to Kansas State, which I think you are attached to, so I know it well. I, Good to see you, uh, Ithar. I'm a Jayhawk. Oh, oh, even better. That's where <laughs> I went to school. <laughs> Great. Okay, Tracy. That's yeah. where I graduated. Rock Chalk J Hot K. That's right. I remember That's that. Right. Bobby. That's right, Bobby. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a thought. Oh, okay. It's this not very common. The, they have that many people this around. Is, <laughs> this is one of about 20 shirts that my wife has. <laughs> I have Gosh. a big blanket too, but it, it would cover the computer. Yeah, uh, she's a. Uh, Rock Chalk, she graduated in, I can't remember when, in music. Nice. She the Western. Gosh, I, I think we're in Kansas. So now we got some <laughs> Jayhawkers. Okay. Rock Chalk. Is Good. Dorothy there? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Back to Tracy. That's right. Well, I, yeah, I think places like Kansas are like Oregon and that they, they don't have the levels of racial diversity as elsewhere. And so it's easy to say, well, it's not something that's important or something we need to deal with. I know my own brother in the small town I grew up with, um, they have a mascot for their high school that is not considered appropriate by many people. And he says, well, there's no one in town that is upset by it. And he ignores the fact that all the natives that lived in, in Kansas in that area are now, um, either in Oklahoma or no longer living. Um, so it's, it's a challenge to be aware of it. And I think that um, in Kansas as in Oregon, often there's a sense that it's not an issue we deal with, not something we need to deal with. And I think that that is a challenge and it's important for us to have an inclusive history that really talks about racial class and gender issues everywhere. It doesn't matter who lives in your community because our students are going everywhere and they're interacting in an international world. We know that in a connected world. 
and everyone needs it. Um, I was working with a high school teacher in Silverton a few years ago, and we were talking about how we need to include diversity in our class. You know, teaching your and said, "Well, we just don't really have diversity in Silverton," mm. which isn't even true. <laughs> it's a it's a it's like people have blinders on and they can only see certain parts of the community. And, and that's one thing that a history taught well can overcome. It can be a challenge um, and allowing each student to have their, um, to have a, a voice, not a pressured voice as someone mentioned, but allow a, multiple viewpoints to be seen of the history is really. Well, and that, that's such a crazy comment from that teacher because Silverton had a transgender mayor. I mean, you know, it's like, hello. <laughs> um, the Latino have, population of Silverton is probably pretty high. Yeah. I have a question too about, um, so I think in English, you know, if, if I can remember back, like reading, you know, literature, you had to read Grapes of Wrath, which would tell you about the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Dust Bowl years, or you read, you read different ones, you know, that tell you about different parts of history in English class. And so I don't know if that works hand in hand with history that, that hey, you read these books and, and what, what can happen there. I was thinking because I'm starting to read a lot of, since this, since this group's been meeting, you know, reading a lot of uh, uh, novels uh, written by Black uh, African Americans and things and, and, uh, and, and, and that are teaching. And then you get a lot of the history, you know, uh, yeah. uh, there. And I was just wondering if, there, if, if there's a combination of between history and English. Um, yeah, and they, they do overlap. And, you, and whether whether the curriculum there, whether you guys, whether they're even conscious, because they were very conscious of, you yeah. got to read this book to learn about the revolution, you read this novel, it'll teach you about this, and this will teach you about this. And it was more, you know, a little more interesting than just facts and dates. But, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard anybody talk about uh, literature that's been written by, which is out there now. And, and, and Absolutely. anything about that in the curriculum of an English class? Yeah, I think they've definitely diversified and been very mean, um, purposeful. In history class, one of our favorite things to do is have them read autobiographies or firsthand accounts. Yeah. And if you want to, I'll have one recommendation if you want to know about slavery, um, very good, quick book. It actually was made into a major movie. So you might have seen this movie. But it's um, Solomon, Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave. He's a yep. man that was a free man in New York and captured. Mm -hmm. And I, the book, of course, as usual, is much better than the movie. I think the movie gives a, a mood, maybe. But um, it's very readable. It's very accessible. And it's a good way. And I think it's a way that even 11-year-olds in fifth grade could really do. And if you've ever been around little kids, you'll know there's a lot of really good historical fiction these days. There's a Dear America series. There's an American Girl series. There's probably many more that kind of take a viewpoint of a, a child and talk about an immigrant experience they're having or maybe they're a Native American girl. Um, and they're doing a really good job at that. I think that is really a powerful teaching method where you can, you connect to another person and you can learn about them in a very meaningful way. Um, yeah, okay. And the autobiography is actually more of a, a historical uh, history teaching method then. Yes, right. To give them we tend to be a little funny about novels, although sometimes we offer them. Yeah, but autobiography would be another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a, a, an interesting story about seeing the movie 12 Years a Slave. My husband yeah. and I were traveling in Georgia at the time. Yeah. And uh, we ended up seeing the movie in an all black neighborhood in, yeah. in Atlanta. And I wanted to crawl out of that theater out of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. mm. It, it, was, it was such a jarring experience. And I mean, I'm getting chills thinking about it. It was just the, you know, the white privilege guilt that I felt. It was, it was very moving, even more moving than it would have been watching it here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something you can do with young people in your life. Take them to these movies. There was a movie just recently made about Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. yeah. Selma. There's a lot of really good, um, um, movies that have been made um, recently that 
there's a couple been about Black Panthers, right? Mm-hmm. And the One Night in Miami, I think, is about Malcolm X. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of them that are really um, accessible. And I think that, you know, history can be very dry and can be very meaningful. And I think it's meaningful when someone you love or you care about or you respect who is very interesting is sharing it with you. So I again would pitch, please share what history you have or what history you know or what history you've read with young people so that they can um, connect or maybe give them uh, one of these autobiography series for presents so they can um, understand and, uh, and approach it. Anyway, yes. Just Mercy. I don't think mm-hmm. I know that one. Just Murphy, Mercy is a great movie. Uh, I'm going to put all of this in our uh, further explorations document. Everything we've talked about here this evening. I, you know, I think there's another thing that's happening, and and I think it probably goes back to the George Floyd uh, the, that whole mm-hmm. business. But I've noticed in TV on TV shows and advertising. Uh, they're they're uh, using more black actors uh, and uh, and uh, blacks in advertising, and uh, and and I you know that that uh, is something that uh, we need to see and we need to do more of. But it's uh, you know it, you you see like last night we were watching FBI and you've got black agents. And, 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 and they're not just talking about, well, we're going to go arrest, arrest this person out here who's violated the law. They have arguments with each other and had a rip from the headlines type discussions with each other. And uh, I think it's important for us to see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and particularly if you live in an area where you may not see a lot of diversity of people. That's right. A lot of people in Oregon, we, exactly. because we have the racial, racial segregation in general um, and just not that. Yeah, that's right. That's important. I would, you know, I have a suggestion as well is just to try to, if you're on social media or or something like that, make purposeful to follow people that are not like you, that Mm -hmm. have different experiences or different ethnicity or a different religion. Um, Even that can be a little bit mind opening, you know, awareness of holidays or traditions that you're not a part of. And there's so much potential to connect with others. It's so tragic, it seems that, to me, that so much of our reality is that we're more sheltered than ever. Um, and I don't think we anticipated that, but we can use the radical potential of what we have to expand as well and just seek something new, new out. So. Tracy, that's a great point you just made because Even on Facebook alone, there's so many groups that speak to racial justice. Uh, There's the Dallas Justice Alliance, I'm thinking in Dallas, Oregon. There's there's Women for Racial Equality. There's LBGQ uh, Episcopalians on Facebook. I mean, there's just a vast, and all you have to do is go on the search line and put a word in and you'll see all these different groups. Yeah, great point. So history has been challenging, but um, I think that we have some challenges in in teaching it. I think not enough people are learning it, but I think all of you can do your part. Just advocate for it, make it fun, talk about it, um, particularly with young people and encourage them. Um, They don't get a lot of history. So the more that you can um, augment it, if you know that this is the year that they're learning Oregon history, take a young person on a field trip somewhere maybe that will support it. I think going to historical sites is really a a meaningful thing. So the degree to which you can do that or you encourage others, I think that's important as well. Mm -hmm. Rich and Janice put into chat, we only listen to the news. Let me go back here. We only listen to news that regurgitates what we believe rather than news that make us think, of course. And Becky said, um, about Harvard-educated Black grad Brian Stevenson, who goes to Alabama to represent poor people who cannot afford legal counsel, especially those in the prison system. He took a case to the Supreme Court. Yes, I followed that. That was amazing. There's so much out there. And it's like you said earlier, Tracy, it's at our fingertips. I mean, we can just, I'm there. Robert. Um, there's also the fact that your phones 
kind of dial into your area and your, um, so you get the feedback that they are trying to give you. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful of that. Yeah, the algorithms. Yeah. Tracy, thank you for, for I, I have a whole sheet of notes I took from, from what you said, and I really appreciate it. I learned something new every time we have one of these sessions. Thank you so much. Any, so, any, anything else you want to add? No, but I was glad that all of you came together and talked about race. I think we're definitely at a inflection point in terms of race in this nation. And the more that we can learn about it and be a part of it and encourage other people to pay attention, I think that we really could probably are in historic times in terms of race. So stay tuned, mm -hmm. be a part of it. Um, do what you can. This is now not the time necessarily to sit on the back, back burner. Right. I think um, right. we could really be making a change in a meaningful way for millions of Americans. Mm -hmm. I listened to a um, thing on Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. There's a history on him. I think it, it wasn't a um, biography, but it was an autobiography. Oh. And it didn't say anything about how he felt about Indians, but from another source, I heard that he said that only the only good Indian was a dead Indian. So you still got to watch out for the white gaze. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about cancel culture. I think from a historical perspective, we just want to know about somebody in their entirety. Exactly. All of us are complex. Some of it we like, some of it we don't, but we need to understand it first. First understand it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then use your own judgment, whether that's something you want to, you know, say that's great that happened or it didn't. We want to make sure that continues. We want to fight to make it not continue. But first, understand someone and their complexity. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt did a lot of amazing things, but the fact that he was might have said something like oh, that doesn't surprise me either. Mm -mm, um, definitely either. And it shouldn't scare us to learn about that whole complexity about somebody. It, it doesn't mean that he those positive things he did weren't positive as well. Um, we just need to understand the totality, and I, I think that's uh, can be scary for some. And I think that's one of some of the reaction right now, but. But um, one of the other it, ones it, is Woodrow Wilson and yeah. uh, Princeton and what they have to yeah. deal with the graduate school that's named Woodrow Wilson School of International mm -hmm. Affairs. I can't remember how they finally decided to deal with that, but, uh, you know. Yeah, Portland's Wilson High School is getting renamed, I saw. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, so, yeah, <laughs> it, it is tough. I mean, because because like you said, it's everybody's complex and. And, and I don't know if this, this, this is true or not. Uh, Fred's a, a theologian too, but I always want to say that the Old Testament stands the test of time because they put in everything. They didn't, they didn't mince any words. I mean, David, you know, if he was the king, he could have left out Bathsheba. They could have left that story out. Dang it, it made him look bad. And, uh, you know, but they didn't. And, and so you read the Old Testament and it's got all sorts of bad stories, but it's got, they're all, it's all there. And it's and, and I think about that. I think when all these people want to cancel hit our hit our American history, it's like, well, let's just throw it all in there. Let's just, you know just do it. I don't think historians are ever going to stop talking about Woodrow Wilson, but um, we might talk about him differently. Yeah, exactly. Put in all our ugly history. Just mm -hmm. throw it all in there. Yeah. Carol, you yeah. had a comment or a question? Yeah. Um, Lori, I may have shared this with you before, but um, I'm needing a reminder. The civics teacher from Portland area, who is a retired librarian and a retired um, school teacher, did the, the information about um, her adult classes in civics, did I send that to you? Yes, you did. Okay. But I'm, I'm going to be posting that. Well, then I'll just, I'll, I'll give a two sentence plug here. Okay. Uh, her name is Donna mm -hmm. Cohen. Mm -hmm. C -O -N. Look for that information when Lori sends it out, because Donna is somebody who I've learned a lot from every free workshop I've signed up for. Mm -hmm. What she teaches for adults 
whether it's talking about misinformation and disinformation and um, social media and regular media, or what she's talking about um, other government related issues, it, you'll, you'll like it. Yeah, thank you, Carol. I'm gonna include that in my uh, summary of tonight. The, 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 the key terms and future and further exploration document is going to be very long when I send it out mm -hmm. because I have a lot of information to put on it. Thank you. So um, I, I do wanna say something. Sure, Bobby. Yes. Um, I have really appreciated those um, those comments that you send out to us when you give us the link okay. if we want to look because all the like I've gone back a couple of times looking at the PDFs and seeing oh yeah there's a book I want to look into that or that was talked about so however long it is bring it on I really appreciate you doing all that work for us. Thank you, Bobby. It's, it, I think it's really, really important because we've had such rich conversations these last few months. I mean, every, con every session is rich and, and, and so much participation and, and many of you send emails. Carol sends me emails. Bobby, you send me. So many people say, hey, what about this? And um, it's so important to get all that out there. It's really important. So Fred and I want to do a, a little bit of a, in a good way. Yeah, thank you, Carol. I said it, it can be overwhelming, but in a good way. I know, I know. Overwhelming is okay because you can pick and choose. Fred and I want to um, uh, wrap some things up here and let you get on with a break from us for about three weeks. So. Um, I want to just do a little bit of a summary here, uh, thinking about last week and the conversation we had with Cheryl Kennedy, our speaker from Grand Ronde. And um, I loved when she said in her, in her presentation to us that as Native Americans and indigenous peoples, they look seven generations ahead. I love that. And I, that wasn't new information to me, but I loved how we, she phrased that. And one of the th many things I found about her presentation to be really awe-inspiring was she mentioned the word hope several times and the hope she feels for her future. And that's all tied into that looking ahead seven generations. And as she discussed uh, the many, many years, Grand Ronde alone has worked within the system and the processes of our government to bring about necessary change. I just, I, I've thought about that so often this last week and wondered how many of us would have that kind of patience. I mean, the, I can think back to the very first session of uh, the beginning of Thursday conversations to end racism way back September 17th. And one of the questions we received in that first session was, but what do we do about it? Well, I think of the Grand Ron peoples with this vast patience of working through and walking the journey and how we as white people, we want an answer right now. We want to end racism. We want to do this. What do we do and how do we do it? Na, na, na. And it's not that simple. So Cheryl's conversation uh, with us reminded me of a story uh, that I heard uh, recently on the Apaya Zen Center website. And it's a very simple analogy between the functions of a spider and how the creation of its web can relate to the work of humans in today's world. And it's so simple, it's just so simple. And this presentation spoke about how a spider attends to her web. The definition of attend in Zen communities means to stretch the mind until one can listen with a soft heart. 
To attend means to stretch and hold fast, and it requires tenacious tenderness. So what would happen if we could learn to be tender in our tenacity in the midst of the dis deep disagreement that we are surround us in our political realms, just like a spider creates her web in unknown surroundings. And this is where this um, presentation taught it, brought it together. Uh, what is most startling about a spider is her genius in thoughtfully touching and anchoring her web in the most unlikely of anchor points in her space. If we attend closely, we will notice this about a web. What holds the center are its strong ties to the margins. What if we learned, what if we learned not to fear the uncomfortable, not to fear our edges, not to fear the margins that are unknown to us? What do spider webs teach us about our polarization in this country? If we are this divided in our nation, if trust has been destroyed, if they, whomever they is, don't understand, where do we start? Years ago, um, and I teach this in my cultural geography class, uh, in the midst of a raging war between tribes and clans in uh, eastern, northeastern Kenya and western Somalia, there's a small community of Wajir. And a small group of women in this community found a way to make their local marketplace a safe place, even when they were raging clans, conflicts, and everything going on around them. The marketplace in African communities is very, very strong. That's the centerpiece of most communities. So what these several women did in this community is the first thing was they quote, they sat together to see what they knew. So they reached out of their comfort zone. They gathered information, they listened carefully, they were incredibly brave and thoughtful. And it required each of the women to reach out beyond their bubble of their immediate circle. So the lesson, obviously, if we want to affect change, we have to start small, we have to start local, because big leaps are not the starting point. We have to expand our circle and we have to listen and grow ideas for change. Fred. To reach a pinnacle, the hiking path doesn't go straight up a mountain. It crisscrosses with lots of resting places along the way. One step forward and, and, and sometimes there'll be two back. Uh, and that's, that's okay. And that's important, I think, for us to remember as we, as we talk about this journey, it's okay, it's okay. Um, there, the key is that we don't stop. Now, when we started these, these conversations, my whole idea was that we were going to get a, a class together at my church, and we were gonna sit in the parish hall, and we were gonna have a class through the fall. It was going to be a class. We'd have a book and we'd read it and all of that. And then the more we thought about it, and as Greg and Laurie and I talked about it, uh, we decided, you know, it, it, it's not going to work, obviously, to have an in-person class. And so we're going to have to go to the media. And that's how we reached out to Zoom. And so we started uh, with just this small class in mind, and it was just going to go through the fall. As we talked about those early times, it's just going to go through the fall. And then the more we got into it, we thought, well, we at least have to go through the winter now. There's more here than we than we realized. And then as we got to, uh, we started in the winter, we decided, you know, we've got to look at spring. And so we're that's what we're going to be starting on April 8th. Uh, we can't wait, and we can't, we decided we can't wait for a miracle to come to us when it appears that everyone has ceased with practices that promote racism. 
We need to reach out to what we can touch now within our reach. We need to keep touching the places that we can. And so here we are tonight. We've got, we've had 17 people and we've had 20, 25 and 30. Uh, and, and it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, in, in a lot of history of the church, uh, people met in living rooms. And, uh, and, and, you know, there have been political campaigns that have been started in living rooms. And there's so much that's happened in, in homes along the way. And so what we need to look at is that we're a living room. And uh, the, the strength that we have is that we're in a whole bunch of living rooms. And in those living rooms across the country. Uh, and so the, the question that we have to ask is, you know, we're, we're one conversation uh, and, and that's it. So what do we do? Well, we're not really one conversation. We've learned another thing as we've gone along. We're one of thousands of conversations that will, are meeting around the country and the world for all we know. And so, uh, and, and, and I think that's the magic of, of the internet. So there are thousands then of conversations and we've got to understand that to begin with. So like the spider that Lori was talking about, we need to travel a little bit beyond our areas of comfort. We need to circulate back and forth, leaving traces of our ideas. And we can't be afraid of the spiky stuff in our way. We need to just use it to anchor our threads. Besides the spiky stuff gives us a better idea of the world that we inhabit and the other creatures that ultimately affect our lives and the lives of our planets. And you heard tonight, you heard Tracy talking about uh, the uh, civics and history and all of that in the discussion, which was, was really a good discussion about the influence of one state on textbooks. And, you know, we were talking about history, but, oh, I so wanted to mention something else that I bet would be influenced from state to state. And you know what? I'm going to mention it. How do you think human sexuality would be dealt with from one state to the next? Oh, yeah. About that. And so here we talk about, we talk about history, and this has been a great discussion tonight. But think about all the different things that we have. Literature, what are we gonna read? Just literature for fun. Uh, that's gonna vary. And people are going to have a lot of things to say about that. And so it, it, it really does start getting back down to this business of uh, local school boards, of state departments of education. And you heard the exchange about the legislature and, you know, I was a member of the body. I know what the legislature is about. I was president of the Senate. But that is not the all power. All power is down with the people where the school boards are. And that's where we can really make a difference. We need to remember then that spider webs don't repair themselves. Spider must always attend to her web. And we need to stretch our minds just far enough to soften our hearts and to seek to stay grounded when we stretch. And we can do this, we're practicing tenacious tenderness and tender tenacity. So during our spring series, and you notice we haven't laid that all out just yet. Well, we've got, we've got plans. During our spring series, which begins April 8th, we'll be exploring the how-tos and the next steps. The title of our spring series is American Democracy and Citizenship. We'll examine voter empowerment We'll talk about equality of representation. We'll talk about social media for the public good, ensuring responsive government, connected communities, and how to inspire a culture of commitment. We hope you'll join us as we continue our journey to understanding and change. And let me say something else that these legislators around the country are scared to death of. Anybody know what that might be? The initiative. Oh, right. The initiative. What is the initiative? What is the initiative? It's where the people circulate petitions, it's signatures, and it goes on the ballot, and the people decide. And that may be what we're going to be working with, with all of these different conversations around the country. And that's where we are. It's really exciting. 
So thank you all. And uh, we hope you have a good break and uh, a, a wonderful, uh, blessed Easter holiday. And hopefully we'll see some of you back on April 8th. Martin, you wanted to uh, comment? No, you're fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy.